professor. It belonged to uh, his buddy who is still teaching at the Budapest, it's called the Ferenc Liszt Academy, Music Academy in Budapest in Hungary. And this summer I was there and I met the guy. It used to belong to him. It's made by a Hungarian um, violin maker who lived in Germany. His name is Janusz Spiegel. This instrument has been made in 1926. So it's not exactly 100 years old, but almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, as you know, instruments could vary in prices, and uh, for some reason, Italians, uh, Italian violin makers happen to be the best. They found the secrets in uh, uh, making the instrument and making it sound really good. Um, the most expensive violin ever purchased was a violin made by Antonio Stradivari, and it was purchased by a Russian billionaire for $15 million a couple of years ago. Maybe I'm behind, and nowadays they sell instruments for more money than that, but. Uh, uh, <coughs> Um, they, they vary in prices, they're pretty expensive, and I, have, I can say that this is the most expensive thing that I own. <laughs> Would you tell them the story you told me the other day about, um, was it Russian violence in communist countries or something? You can't bring expensive oh, yes, violence yes, yes. out. I, uh, uh, I, I have a lot of friends, and every time they come to town to play with the symphony, they stay in my place, we party, we drink vodka, and, and have fun. And one of the, his friends is a, a lady from Ukraine who came with her husband. And I love cleaning violins, making them really nice and shiny. So I cl was cleaning her violin, and I looked and looked inside the violin, and uh, it was written 1942. And I said, ooh, who's, your, who's the maker of this instrument? She said, well, it's a Russian maker, but it's not made in 1942. It was made in 1912. I said, oh, really? But it says 1942. She said, well, before I, when I had to leave Ukraine, uh, the, the person who repairs her violin with a pencil wrote 42, because they have a law that if you, if you cannot take an instrument that is more than 50 years old out of the country. So they have to change that number inside for the customs. So, oh, okay, that's a new instrument, take it out. So that was really interesting. <laughs> what musicians do to, <laughs> to <coughs> uh, uh, just take their instrument. And of course, there are some musicians who forget their instruments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Recently, I read about somebody leaving a multi-million dollar instrument on the train. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, the violin has four strings, they're all tuned in perfect fifths, and uh, probably not many people have looked inside the instrument, but there is a little piece of wood that is called sound post, and uh, it's my favorite part of the instrument because it changes the sound according to uh, what you really want. And it's adjusted by the violin makers. They have a special tool that adjusts this little um, piece of wood inside. And um, it changes the sound. The lower strings could sound stronger, the higher strings could sound weaker. Anything you want to do, you have to adjust that little thing and inside. I can show it to you later. <laughs> And, <clears throat> and of course, another important part of the uh, violin is, of course, the bow. The bows are, uh, they also vary in prices. And uh, um, the French have mastered the art of uh, making the perfect bow. And to many people, it's just a stick, but this stick could cost $100,000, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, a musician will look in, in the quality of the, of the stick, how it jumps, and what it does in the instrument, how how it produces the sound, and uh, the tension, and the evenness of the sound, and all these little things that uh, musicians listen to. <laughs> like my former teacher says, 
we're not musicians, are not normal people. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, when a person gets excited because a note got changed, and it's, it's <laughs> it lights up his life, that's not a normal person. <laughs> so, any other questions before I play something for you? Okay. <clears throat> I'll play a piece called a uh, Madrigal by Simonetti. <laughs> something faster that, that is called Badineri and it is a piece by Bach originally written for the flip.
has that material changed over time, or is that the the bowl or the the, or the, the bowl? Bowl. I'm just curious yes, what yes. they're made of. Yes. And, okay. Uh, centuries ago, they they were made of the guts. They were guts. Cat guts. gut is what. Yes. Yes. Nowadays, what they do is they uh, use a synthetic uh, core inside, and outside is the metal, and um, um, they're getting really, really good <laughs> because <clears throat> the gut strings were very vulnerable to um, uh, weather changes and low humidity mm -hmm. can affect the, the, the strings. And they always get out of tune. Nowadays, the strings get really quickly in tune and everything is really much better. And uh, um, the better the strings, the better the price, of course. <laughs> A set, a set of strings uh, could cost some hundreds of some dollars. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. For four strings. The bow, <coughs> the hair of the bow is, uh, they say that the best hair comes from Siberian horses. I don't know why. And they have to be male horses. <laughs> and of course, <coughs> uh, they do something to the hair to keep it really nice and white. And the bow hair is changed twice a year by professional musicians. I personally change it once a year. Um, depends how much you play. If you practice five hours a day, yes, I have to change it every six months. And uh, in, the, in the violin shops and around the country, anybody can change their hair. It's not an easy job, but uh, uh, they do it. <laughs> yeah. So it is the hair that wears out, not the strings? Both. Yeah, the strings, the, <clears throat> the more you play, the, the strings uh, get more stretched, they get out of tune, so you have to change them. A newer string will have more concentrated sound, more projecting sound, better quality of the sound. And the strings too, the, the hair, the hair of the bow. There's a moment when <clears throat> if the bow is too, too uh, the hair is too old, the, bow, the, the hair starts sliding cannot really produce the sound. And of course we need rosin, which is this little thing <laughs> that helps <clears throat> produce the sound. It's a sticky substance little thing that we put on the bow before we play to make the string vibrate. So, <clears throat> and of course musicians are very picky about their rosins and everything. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How is Pat as a student? Very good. <laughs> Very good. Can't go to play today? No. <laughs> no. Next week's program will be Pat. Every once in a while I'll get a not bad, and I feel like that's okay. <laughs> that's a compliment. <laughs> In that uh, PBS show, The Celtic Women, yeah. they have young ladies playing violin and prancing all over the stage at the same time. How hard is that? How hard is this? Well, I never heard them live. I've seen the, the DVDs because of Pat, by the way. And <clears throat> I believe that uh, it's just for show. It's impossible to move so much on the stage and still play in tune. It's, it's just crazy. And uh, everything is pre-recorded <laughs> and uh, on the playback. <clears throat> but, they, they do a good show. <laughs> How often uh, uh, in the symphony do you, I guess, uh, the different violin violinists and other members compete for the first chair or second chair? Well, in, in every orchestra, you know, every professional orchestra, there, there are auditions. And uh, um, there are auditions, they're announced each year and people audition and if they win the audition, they get the spot and they get the title. Just once a year then? Yes. Okay. Yes, once a year. I, in a professional setting. If it's a union orchestra, yeah, that, there's some union rules that you have to follow. In other orchestras, it's the music director that decides who did that chair, who's going to sit next to it, and <laughs> rotate, move. Yeah. It's not easy to, to please 80 people on the stage. <laughs> it's our job. <clears throat> so I prevailed upon him to bring some of his business cards. If anybody wants to um, do the serenade thing for your wife for Christmas or Valentine's Day or birthdays. Or I also play in churches, and if you, if you go to Christmas Eve 
masses in the cathedral and you hear a violin, it will be me. <laughs> I've been playing there for the last 10 years. <clears throat> and sometimes I walk in the convent and of course in any other church that uh, needs musicians. <laughs> sometimes uh, things get really busy around the Christmas days, uh, especially in December. For example, for last Saturday, December 10th, I had seven phone calls for different concerts from different towns asking for musicians. And I can't be in seven places at the same time. <laughs> Everybody needs musicians. Can you send them a recording? <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for that. you uh, coming and in, in entertaining us and sharing uh, some history about your instrument and your trade. This is a cup we'd just like to, to send with you as a token of our gratitude and it uh, has our title of the club on it and the four-way test that thank means you. so much to us as we're Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.